Hey guys, Jeffrey here with another episode of Auto Alchemy, and this video is going to be part of my typewriter series. So today I'm going to be speaking with Michelle Wilson. Um, <laughs> hi Michelle, hey. thank you for joining me on the channel. Um, Michelle is an ENFP and also a writer, obviously, so there's going to be hopefully a lot of common ground with our cognitive functions, especially our dominant function. So I was excited about the conversation, and Michelle, do you want to say anything about yourself? Maybe plug your channel? Yeah, sure. Um, you can just go to, I just got a, an official website link. So it's like youtube.com slash C slash Michelle Wilson. Wow. Somehow I wrangled that. I don't even know how, like no other Michelle Wilson out there. Like, are you kidding? Um, and I post... It is an exotic name. Oh yeah. It's, it's like not the like most common combination of names possible. <laughs> um, so yeah, that's my channel. And uh, I <laughs> the last year I didn't post a whole lot, but before that I was posting pretty much every week, so I'm trying to get back into that. Um, mm -hmm. My work was really crazy, so, you know, excuses, excuses. Hopefully I'll be posting <laughs> videos quasi-regularly. <laughs> so what would you say the general theme of your channel is? Uh, I'd say probably, like, a lot of my videos are about personality, because I'm obsessed with Myers-Briggs. Some of it's about writing, but I do want to branch out further than that. I just haven't really thought, I haven't really like honed in the exact audience that I'm looking to, to yeah. gain, but I'm just like, I'll just keep doing whatever like interests me at the time. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, that resonates with me as well, actually. Like there's a lot of, well, ideally in my head, my channel is self-growth, personality theory, psychology, some philosophy, some writing. And so ultimately, I guess if you complicate it too much, then it just becomes The Jeffrey Show, right. which I don't know that I can coast on my personality. But isn't that like what all YouTube channels are? Is it is, the you yeah, show. ultimately. I mean, it's called yeah. YouTube, not they tube, I'm just saying. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Um, I highly encourage everybody to check out Michelle's channel because it's really, really great. And I hope she makes more videos. I'll try. Get to work. <laughs> I'm trying. Uh, so. Um, going back to writing then, could you just give us an overview of your journey as a writer, kind of stripping away all the MBTI stuff? Like, just when did you start writing? What sort of genres have you written? What's your relationship with it? So when I think about my writing journey, I like bring it back way, 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 way back to my youth. And I have this one distinctive memory of, I don't know, I was less than nine, more than five, because I knew how to write, but I had written down 50 words and I was so proud of myself. <laughs> like, look, mm -hmm. I wrote 50 whole words. <laughs> like, uh, And then, you know, I didn't really think too much of myself as a writer. I found this assignment that I did in, um, I think it was fourth or fifth grade, where I had to imagine myself as a pencil. And I gave this pencil like this whole like <laughs> adventure where it like rolled off the desk away from the writer because it didn't want to be like <laughs> destroyed anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> and then in middle school, I did like fan fiction, so there is a fanfiction.net account of mine. <laughs> no one needs to know what it is. I've read through them and they're terrible, but I mean, how good can you be when you're like 11? <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, yeah, it was uh, mostly like Harry Potter and Teen Titan <laughs> fan oh, fiction. Okay. Yeah, good stuff. There's a <laughs> strong possibility that I read some of it at some point. <laughs> yeah, so at the end of middle school, beginning of high school, I had this idea for like, these like basically an equivalent of a furry but like realistic <laughs> like this guy was like half dog and this girl was half cat <laughs> and they were like from two different worlds like <laughs> yeah that's <definitely>. very <laughs> contrived I see the appeal <laughs> and then yeah. in college I met my friend Melissa with one L and one S yeah uh, she was also an ENFP <laughs> um, and she she is the one who introduced me to NaNoWriMo and I did it that year, though I didn't do any writing really. I was just like, oh, NaNoWriMo, that's so cool. Let's write a book in a month. <laughs> um, but then she, uh, my friend um, Gracie, who is an INFP, and then our friend Luke, who is an INTJ, we all started this like round robin writing thing. <laughs> mm. <laughs> and it was like this whole crazy story where, um, we were at the campus of school and we went into this tree house and like me and Melissa of course found a time machine 
<laughs> and we brought us forward to the future and like the the conservatives had taken over cuz you know like <laughs> this was like 2010 so yeah mm -hmm. you c the political climate in 2010 I mean like president obama was just anyway yeah and then me and my friend the ENFP the other ENFP friend we ended up getting captured <laughs> Mm -hmm. And like our INTG, INTJ friend was like eating off the geese and stuff <laughs> like he was fending for himself and he's the one who found the solution to everything because of course because he's the scientist. Yeah. <laughs> so that round robin story happened for a little while like uh, and then um, one of my other friends who was an INFJ he was a writer and he shared with me his story. And then that kind of got me into this, like, oh, okay, like, I think I really like making, like, psychological stories where it really makes you think. So, like, this story I tried to write the next year for 2011 for NaNoWriMo, which, it was a historical fiction and I had no idea about the history, so <laughs> that didn't go very far. But basically the whole premise was it was, like, a six-year-old girl who created um, an imaginary friend and he became real over time and he didn't realize that he was an imaginary friend like he grew up with her like he stayed the same age and you know of course like it changed from feelings of fatherhood to friendship to like lovers or whatever that was gonna be the whole oh. premise but oh, it didn't okay. last very oh. long uh, and then the next year I wrote like a the start of this story about this guy who thinks it's a zombie apocalypse. Basically the idea is he thinks it's a zombie apocalypse, he runs away, he hides in the woods, he kills people that he thinks are zombies, um, and then he comes back home and he thinks that his best friend's turned into a zombie, so he ends up killing his best friend and then he ends up in a psychological ward because obviously he's oh. crazy. <laughs> uh, then <laughs> I had this totally terrible idea, but I was like, oh, this is so great. <laughs> for the story where this girl, well actually nobody had genders, but I thought of her as a girl. So nobody had genders, so I had to write their pronouns as the first two letters of their name. <laughs> so. Oh, interesting. So um, you can imagine how quick, uh, complicated that would get. <laughs> yeah, have you ever read any Ursula Le Guin? I have not. Oh, she, she does sci-fi, but she likes to play around with gender a lot, so I was just wondering if maybe that was an inspiration. And then the next year, I think I tried to write the zombie book again and failed. <laughs> oh, uh-uh. It was another story about uh, this girl in the 1960s who moves to San Francisco, <laughs> which wasn't a psychological story at all. It was just going to be like, whatever. And then I started the sci-fi series that I'm on now, which I actually have finished. I'm about to finish the second book. So I, clearly there was something a little bit more there with these stories clicked mm -hmm. more with yeah. me and actually came into some kind of fruition. I don't think that I have nearly as many like attempts at writing something. Like I usually gave up pretty early when something when I felt that it wasn't going to work, so I only have like the things that worked out to talk about. Oh, see I talked about everything that didn't work out. <laughs> I think that the issue is that the boredom kicks in a lot sooner for me mm. so I write like a chapter and then so in my head it's not even something that I would want to talk to people about like oh wow this one time I wrote a prologue <laughs> that was going to be about you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> see and I'm, I put and I think that right there kind of shows the difference in our personality because I put so much more meaning into the stories and why I've created them that they like mean a lot to me even though nothing mm -hmm. came of them whereas you're like mm. and I think this is a difference between TI and FI and correct me if you like disagree but like I have like attached myself to them and I'm like these are a part of me they're a part of my expression of myself whereas you're like mm -hmm. I'm gonna and I'm you can correct me at any point if I say this wrong but you're more like I'm gonna create this really cool idea to teach people something or to like get this really cool point across and then if it doesn't work out you're just like meh okay I'll just move on and clearly it wasn't meant to be <laughs> yeah yeah it's very hard for me to feel a sense of attachment even to like characters that I've created that's something that I've always envied um, and other writers because some people talk about it so naturally and I'm like what am I missing you know <laughs> but 
at least with my um, current book, the one that I've actually mostly completed, I do feel that sense of attachment. I've somehow like worked my way in the in the right direction, Good. and it's like very dear to me. As um, well, it's almost like I don't know. I still don't see it as a part of me necessarily. It feels almost like I've unearthed something, mm. and the thing that I've unearthed, I I see as being valuable, but it doesn't feel like it's me, which is weird. And you know, given my sort of philosophical outlook I think that the boundaries between like inside and outside subjective and objective are very very blurry and in some ways artificial so in a way it is me it's just like a part of me that's like very removed okay if that makes sense yeah. so what brought up the idea for your story what made you start writing it <laughs> okay well let me tell you a little bit about the story okay. <laughs> and um, and then I'll, I'll talk about the motivation, which is um, a weird one. Okay. So the story is more or less about, <laughs> it's about everything, <laughs> I feel, but more or less it's about this young girl who she and her friend discover these really weird channels on a TV, and they start calling them the dark channels, and they're like weird portals into other worlds and... To like moments of like immense suffering in other people's lives and it's like almost like jumping into their subjective point of view to watch it um but so it's like kind of treated as like a harmless thing at first but then it becomes clear that whatever this entity or energy is that's reaching out through the static has sort of a malevolent right. intention and yeah uh it basically is like consuming their like life force and people start like fading from existence and the question is like how do we prevent this from happening how do we how do we stop that from happening and yeah so the book is called the dark channels and um <laughs> the reason so i've always been kind of fascinated with just like this concept of entertainment and like to what degree are we actually like sustaining ourselves by like feeding into like mindless impulses? So I mean, it's not like an allegory for television, but it's more like an allegory for, I guess, like mindless consumption right. in any in any form. And um, regardless, so that's always been in the back of my mind, and I wanted to treat that in a story at some point. But <laughs> the real motivation came from me hearing a song. And mishearing a lyric um, and I thought the guy said something about I had a vision that she saw dark channels but he actually said or she touched dark channels but he actually said dark shadows oh. and I just misheard him but that phrase like really sank into my brain so that's like the really weird motivation and then everything kind of came together because I already had these other ideas stewing and it just felt very like appropriate and gave me clarity about what I wanted to do with the, the idea. Yeah, so it sounds like that that story has a lot of like philosophical meaning for you. Yes, absolutely. It's like me trying to figure out everything to the best of my ability, like to build a introverted thinking framework in the form of a story. So would you say your ultimate goal of the story is to help you understand or to figure it out so you can help other people understand what you figured out? Option two. Okay. I mean, <laughs> option one insofar as it allows me to get to option two. Okay. Interesting. Okay. Like. Oh, go ahead. I just wanted to say that I have, so I sort of have like a sense of, of what I have figured out. But I know that I, to make it like receptive, make people receptive to it, I have to sort of, sort of articulate it a little bit better. Right. And so, I, and then I see like the dark spots where I don't fully understand what I think or right. or, or, or what the territory is. So it, it does help me clarify my own thinking on things. But yeah, ultimately, it's like I, I'm definitely firmly in the camp of. It's almost kind of like a, a cognitive behavioral therapy type right. thing where like if you just like 
think the right thing and you see things as they are, then suffering is going to be lessened. Right. That's really, really interesting because what's funny is like my story is similar in certain aspects and yet vastly different, but a lot of my driving factor is the same. Like I want to figure it out in so much that I can explain it to other people. However, what I'm trying to figure out is not some logical framework. <laughs> it's a mm -hmm. moral framework. Is this morally yeah. correct to do this? Is this the right option? Can we prevent this? So like this, the story that I'm writing started off with a really dark day where I was feeling very nihilistic and I'm like, the only way that this world can get any better is if 99% of the population is just destroyed because there is no hope. <laughs> that was literally how I was feeling that day. So I wrote this big like paragraph about like how that needs to happen and I didn't fully believe it, but then I was reading it over and I'm like, what if a character did fully believe it? What if somebody took it to the extreme and actually acted upon that thought and actually thought that they were doing the right thing by doing that? And then thus sparked my main antagonist, Lucian, who fully believes that to the depth of his core. Um, and then mm. my main character is kind of dragged in with him and he slowly convinces her that like what he's doing by destroying a huge percentage of the population is actually helping humanity as a whole. Um, so another thought that I had had um, after watching, I don't know, have you, have you ever seen Harmony? It's like an anime. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, anyway, it's this like futuristic anime. And basically, I had this thought afterwards that, because I've been watching a lot of sci-fi anime and like they all, like Psychopaths, Harmony, um, Empire of Corpses, like stuff like this, they all take place in like some distant future and it teaches you like one element of society that could go wrong. Um, and I was like, well, you know what's really interesting is that we're at such a cool time in history where we have the best access that we've ever had to all of history, everything that's ever happened, and we also have access to all fiction, pretty much, anything that people have thought could happen in the future. But at the same mm -hmm. time, on top of that, we also have access to the immediate, immediate present moment. So at any moment, you can find out exactly what's happening by going to social media or checking the news or whatever, right. it keeps up. Yeah. So like we're at an incredibly interesting and like powerful time where we have access to all three and if we took a moment to look at what what happened to past civilizations what caused them to fall we look at our current situation and kind of compare that to it and then we also look at sci-fi and futuristic stories and see what could also go wrong then by using all three aspects which obviously is more complicated than three, but that's a way to kind of summarize it. By using all three aspects, yeah. we can kind of find the course of best action to make choices for humanity on the whole, as opposed to what we've been doing, which is all these different countries, all these different states, all these different cities, individually making choices for these individual areas. So, yeah, I mean, that's kind of what got my book going and then so yeah, she, he's trying to convince her that his choice is the right choice. And for a while he does convince her. Um, when he says that he's just gonna turn down the, the, the program, turn down the city. So um, I guess that's kind of hard to, to conceptualize unless I tell you more about the story. Do you wanna hear what it's like about? Well, I want to read it, oh. <laughs> so I'm sort of like, I'm sort of I know. this weird, yeah. <laughs> it's hard, too, because you want to make sure you don't give too much information, especially if yeah. somebody wants to read it. Um, I'll try to be as simplified as possible so that what I'm saying okay. makes sense. Um, basically, it's the far future. Earth 
suffered a major plague. It's called the Red Plague. It basically wiped out a huge portion of humanity. If you've ever seen Contagion, it's kind of like that. People are yeah. like throwing up and like, you know, all the, and I also, uh, yeah, okay. so like a, a giant plague kind of wiped out humanity. Um, then like some 50, 70 odd years later, people created like a, a new government, like a world government and segregated the different continents to take care of different scientific needs because the population was so low, things still needed to happen, so they kind of segregated things out to make sure that people who wanted to do a certain thing would go to that area. So yeah. um, the first book is about the sector called Alpha and they're in charge of manufacturing. Well, I mean, eventually they're going to come to a point where manufacturing is self-sufficient and it doesn't need any human intervention. So what's going to happen to all those people? They're going to be bored, they're going to be mad, they're going to be losing their jobs, losing their sustainability, and there's going to be civil war. And so because of the civil war, they create this like perfect city basically like the city where you can be whatever you want and the only caveat is you have to sign away your life to live here uh, you can mm -hmm. you're not allowed to leave you have to get implanted and like they basically sign a contract to where even like like they can't have children but they get cloned and their clone will take over whatever job they have and keep it wow. going so, so it's like whatever you have you're stuck with unless you can get a contract with a new company etc etc mm -hmm. so anyway um, the main character gets an internship at one of these companies and it turns out to be the company that created the city so she let's let's back it up a step so what how much do you know about quantum computing we'll say that I know nothing okay <laughs> um, so basically there's this like mobile computer and it's a mobile quantum computer and it plugs into the back of your cerebral cortex and connects directly to your brain and what this okay. is hypothetically allowing your brain to do is put all the processing into this little machine on top of that you okay. can store all your memories you can recall all your memories and what's really cool about it is it will um, activate DMT in your brain and DMT is the dream molecule which allows time to stretch it allows you to see things that aren't there so mm -hmm. it can control releases of DMT from your brain and you could potentially oh, wow. stop time indefinitely and go into this like alternate universe where however unlike D like if you were to take something like DMT you kind of go uncontrollably into some other world because it's connected to this computer and you're using your brain, you can project the image that you want to go to. So say you want to, you know, imagine yourself in, let's just talk with a memory to make it easy. So like imagine you're thinking about something that happened in the past and suddenly it's not in the past, you're in your body, you're feeling exactly what you were feeling, you're thinking exactly what you were feeling, and you're seeing exactly what you were seeing. So you're in the memory 100%. It's no longer this kind of like image or thought in the back of your mind. It is your reality for an indefinite period of time while you're in this okay. memory. Yeah. So she has one of those. The city, however, has a core where everybody's connected to it via a chip. So what that means is that the core is in control of what they see and can project images to them. So it controls what images mm. they use. They don't have any control over it. Um, okay. So like the whole point is like they can eat great food, they can wear cool clothes, all the while by being as efficient as possible and wasting as little resources as possible. So instead of wearing these crazy clothes, they can you know buy them on the augments on the AUG store and like wear these cool <laughs> yeah. like augmented clothes. Um, but anyway, so that's that's the city and it's basically uh, a take on consumerism and how it kind of can help you avoid thinking about what reality really is and you want to escape into it and you want to give into it because reality is too hard to take, basically. Uh -huh. Wow. There's actually um, a lot of weird overlap. Uh, there's like one segment of my book where um, 
Uh, not to give too much away, but there's a segment that is very futuristic, and um, I kind of I noticed in your most recent Nano update that you were talking about like how do I think about the science and the actual you know the the logic of this and make it sound plausible, and I kind of cheated a little bit with my weird futuristic section um, because I presented it in such a way that the language has broken down so much that you kind of have to just like let it wash over you mm. and you, you just pick out the patterns. So it's like, even as I was writing it, I was sort of in this weird stream of consciousness fugue state. That's funny. And I'm describing this really weird futuristic kind of scenario where like up on the sky, you can kind of like see your avatar projected. And like, that's where you think that like, you have like a really shitty corporeal existence, but you're like customizing your avatar and I liked the what was the word you used for the um, uh, the customization uh, store the oh the og store, og store yeah that's really cool. Um, I'm going to steal it. <laughs> no, <laughs> you can. I mean, you can. Commu- it's no, called communal no, no, no. borrowing. It's cool. Yeah, communal borrowing. But yeah, there were can, there's something like that. Can you really think story. that I would be the only one who would ever come up with the idea for an og store? Like, it's gonna be a reality no. in like 20 years. Like I already yeah, saw an article definitely. where they're making clothes that can project images. I mean, it's kind of like more like a screen on your clothes. It's not so much like yeah. you can create something, a completely different texture or whatever. But you know, we're yeah. getting in that direction. So people are gonna buy right. Augs and they're not gonna call them augmented shirts or uh, like augmented reality blah. And they're not gonna call it AR shirts either because that's just too much to say. So it's just an Aug, you know? AR. Yeah, I can't wait until um, the Og boots fad. <laughs> I'm so sorry. It's okay. <laughs> so, as an ENFP, what do you think your strengths are in general? But then, more specifically, how do those serve you as a writer? Okay, so before I knew what my personality was it always confused me and now that I I've learned about it it makes a lot more sense but I could get very big picture ideas very easily like that's the first thing I come up with okay here's the basic idea of my story here's the point that I want to get across and then Mm -hmm. the second thing that I always really enjoyed doing was building my characters and their motivations and who they are and why they're doing things um, and why they would be in these situations. Like the why question was one that I asked a lot. Mm -hmm. Why, 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 why? And I think that that is like indicative of high NE, whether it's like first or second, either way. To ask why all the time is a very like, how does this all fit together kind of question as opposed to like a what question. Like what happened? What were they doing, you know? what do they look like etc and that's something I hardly even think about is what they look like and in my books I barely describe people (laughs) I want to leave that to your imagination so they can look like whatever you want them to look like yeah so big picture why and then what their motivations are is usually like the easiest thing for me to do yeah so I I eat my strengths (laughs) Yeah, that makes sense. Um, it's funny. So, like I said, I don't really think a lot about motivation, but I obviously recognize the importance of it, and it's something that you you encounter in writer circles a lot. So for me, I've almost... So my early writing, it's like very clear that I'm trying to use my introverted judgment function as like an attempt at thinking about motivation. So it's all very... Like, all of my characters were very, like, painfully dull because of how logical they were. Like, well, if I want to achieve this, then I must go for this. But if I believe this, then this cannot be true. And that was how I kind of did the, the why. Like, why do they believe that? And why, you know, it was, it was just really painful. And luckily for me, um, the way that I've kind of resolved that problem is just by thinking more about archetypes a little bit. So like knowing that there are certain sort of like character models that have a sort of life of their own that people are familiar with and you know they have sort of like an internal energy 
um, that is somewhat coherent. And then I go in and kind of like shake it up a little bit and make them more dynamic and infuse like a little bit of paradox in them because mm -hmm. that's something that has been hard for me to realize is that there is really like no ultimate like logical model that's going to encapsulate everything. And so just like owning the paradoxical nature of reality Oh, sorry, sorry. I just got like a major migraine. Like, do you ever feel like you just jumped into a parallel universe? Anyway, All the time. <laughs> yeah, I guess it doesn't matter. Um, what was I saying? I think something about like the paradoxical nature of reality and just kind of embracing that, but we're going to move on. That makes me feel a little uneasy right now. <laughs> um, so let's talk weaknesses. Um, how would you describe your weaknesses as an ENFP and how do you think those connect to your writing or how do they manifest in your writing? Um, so I would definitely say like extroverted sensing is a weakness and you can definitely see it in my writing. Like it's almost non-existent. Like I mostly do dialogue and I try to like put in things that people are doing or describe things but that is just like so difficult for me and it feels so boring and even I've been reading this one book by um, Scott Siegler and he does a lot of that he does a lot of describing what's going on and like my I'm just like I skip through those paragraphs mm -hmm. I'm like I'm sure there's something important here but yeah. I'm just gonna gonna skip through so that's something that's like definitely I have to work on and like that's what I do during editing is go back in and add that stuff because I'll put like oh this person broke down and was crying and then I'll never like change her state status so like you just have to assume that for the rest of the <laughs> entire like chapter she's just perpetually crying uh, and somehow it's not affecting the way that she's speaking or anything <laughs> yeah yeah uh, stuff like that and then um, just <laughs> Just probably like having logical reasons behind why people do things sometimes can be remiss. <laughs> mm. I don't know. It's hard to explain. Yeah, I definitely relate to the extroverted sensing thing at least. Like, um, well, first of all, like in my old writing, I, I definitely overcompensated for that. So I would just line by line list every possible action or maneuver and it, it was just so tedious and um, not very fun to read and as somebody who also skips over those sections whenever I'm reading a book I I very gradually came to realize oh if I'm gonna skip reading them then maybe I should skip writing them or, or find some way to condense it a little bit but it, okay so I have a follow-up question to yeah. that and this is kind of what happened to me, but I want to see what your situation is. How did your English classes in college affect how much effort you put into those kind of, that part of the writing? Hmm. Well, I think that it made me realize, so it's kind of like a pendulum, right? Um, before I didn't care at all when I like very, like when I first started writing and had no real context for how to write. I, everything was just super abstract and kind of floating in the air and not grounded to sensation at all. And then my classes made me realize that it actually is important to have that stuff, but I overcompensated. And so I've been trying to like find that sweet spot in the middle. And I think I do a much better job now. I, I probably still over explain on occasion just because I, I don't want somebody to read and, and say, well, she was crying three seconds ago and now she's you know <laughs> shouting gleefully or something <laughs> so I don't know that's pretty that's pretty challenging has it been a calibration for you or do you feel that you yeah yeah actually absolutely and that's kind of why I brought it up because I remember taking a creative writing class which I totally bombed because the teacher wanted things that I could not figure out and part of it was that extroverted sensing so they're all like show don't tell and I took that super literally to mean like show every single action <laughs> and every single thing that's happening and if you're telling it you're like just 
breezing over what's physically happening so like I took it so literally mm -hmm. and made sure that like the physical aspect of what's going on is very like cut and dry <laughs> but it's just so so boring and like it took it took so much away from my ability to write because I'm just focusing so much on filling those in and getting the actions in there yeah which you know before I'm just like okay well I see it so even if I don't write it my readers clearly see what I mm -hmm. see yeah <laughs> yeah it's so easy to interpret show don't tell as well I can't say he drank a cup of coffee I have to say he turned the right faucet handle and <laughs> filled the cup up to the rim and you know <laughs> exactly <laughs> da, 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 da. now they know what it's like process. to make coffee if they didn't know before <laughs> it's brilliant exactly <laughs> that's funny um okay so that makes sense and i actually relate to your weaknesses obviously as another any dom um besides the actual i guess creative process do you feel like your weaknesses manifest at all in the um I guess the act of writing not so much the content but like having like the discipline to sit down and and get to work and <laughs> and sort of <laughs> like put put a leash on that extroverted intuition a little bit oh yeah that's definitely like the reason why I failed to ever finish anything is because of that like oh look b brand new idea this one's way better than the last one I should put all my energy into that and then like five weeks later a new idea would come up so I'm like focusing on that or it even could be in the moment in the day I'm like okay I'm gonna write for like three hours today and then something comes up and I'm like well I'll just do this first and then I'll write okay well I'll just do this first and then I'll write it's like supreme procrastination yeah. <laughs> I think like any doms are like the best at procrastination maybe se doms too maybe mm -hmm. just like extroverted perceiver dominance are just <laughs> yeah because they want to like best at procrastinating gather up so many different experiences and not really like lose themselves into one thing yeah yeah but i've worked on that and I, that's like been like my main focus the last few years is just like forcing myself to like set out the time to write mm -hmm. and word sprints have been the most effective because then I can get a lot done in a very short period of time and get it out mm -hmm. and then I can do something else and then I can come back and it's like okay half an hour I can do half an hour um, whereas like if I just tried to sit and write for three hours I'd probably get like 200 words done yeah yeah because I wouldn't be focused at all huh. Interesting. So do or you I'd have be to... thinking of all the possibilities. Mm -hmm. What could happen? Yeah. <laughs> so whenever you're doing word sprints, do you let the filter fall away? Like, is there any critic sitting at your shoulder watching what you're doing? Or is it more just get it out there? I mean, definitely I've been working to qu quiet that internal critic. <laughs> the one who's like, this is all terrible. Yeah. And I just... Uh, try to remind myself like what my freshman English teacher told me which is like your rough draft is just mud and it has to be mud so you can form the beautiful sculpture later mm -hmm. and I was even thinking about how I used to write when I was in school and had to do essays and stuff and it's pretty similar like I could usually write a decent essay like, you know, those people who, like, write the essay and then turn it in, that used to be me. Like, okay, here it is. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> um, and then I realized through that class and then through my other English classes that, like, if you take the time and edit and make it better, you can make it ten times better mm -hmm. than what it originally was. Yeah. So I try to just be like, okay, well, it doesn't have to be perfect now because even if I did spend all this time trying to make it perfect, it's probably not going to be as good as what will happen when I take the time to edit it. So I might as well just let it out so at least there's something there to work with mm -hmm. as opposed to just keeping it all in my mind where I'm more likely to forget the ideas that I had. Um, and because I never have anything written down, it becomes this like huge project and it seems so overwhelming. Whereas if I just like turn off that critic and just write it's a lot easier to go back in and work on it than just never getting anything done because I'm just mad at how terrible my grammar is <laughs> <laughs> yeah 
Yeah, it's been so liberating to me. I'm I'm pretty perfectionistic at heart, and well, obviously I had like a number of professors in college who were who were just saying things like, "Hey, you know, it's okay, write a crappy first draft. That's how it has to be." Um, but it never really sunk in until I read something online that was like, "You should treat your first draft like." the literary Nazis are walking around door to door and and if you if you write something that has any shred of talent or quality they will kill you so just churn out the most awful thing don't think about quality at all (laughs) and you know make sure that those literary Nazis don't you know mow you down and I was like, oh, I can do that. That's so easy. If, I, <laughs> if I'm actively trying to make a garbage version of the thing that I ultimately want to make, then it becomes kind of fun. Like, uh, I, I just kind of, like, lets all that pressure fall away, and then my any gets to play around to, like, the fullest extent possible. Obviously, I don't try to... <laughs> I mean, sometimes, like, good stuff still comes out, and I don't try to make it bad intentionally for the sake of the right. hypothetical, you know... It's more just like a tool to get into the right mindset, but yeah, that was super liberating for me. I need to do more things like word sprints because I I think that just sitting down and writing is still a pretty big challenge for me. Yeah, it's hard when you're, I don't know, especially like your computer is connected to the internet Mm -hmm. and like YouTube and you know, some random article is only a click away, or you're even like, oh, I should research this for my novel, and then you spend like three hours going down some rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Instead of getting any writing done. <laughs> well, you mentioned research, and I think that research actually kind of comes easily to EPs, but maybe too easily. <laughs> so, like, what is the process like for you and I know that for myself, I will often have like 30 different tabs open, all pertaining to my story. And it becomes very easy to like lose yourself in the research as opposed to focusing. So how do you navigate that? Well, I definitely can relate to having way too many tabs open. And I've tried to like start bookmarking things and stuff or like writing it down. But it's it's a lot of work to do that when I could just keep the tabs open. Mm-hmm. But I'll like read articles about things. Like I'm writing science fiction, so most of my research just ends up being facets of science and stuff. Yeah. Um, but I also use personality a lot, MBTI, so it's like another mm. reason to go ahead and research more about how these two types might interact in person. Oh, what yeah. Might, what might go wrong, what could yeah. go well. <laughs> Whoa. But, um, so, navigating it I don't know if I have any <laughs> uh, that's fair it's an ongoing <laughs> process <laughs> <laughs> I mean it's kind of a gift and a curse you obviously can't like I don't know it can be hard to find a middle ground sometimes and it's okay to have like perceived weaknesses that ultimately still make you a better writer or a more interesting writer um, You mentioned MBTI, so I've never thought about doing that. I I have taken the test as a character before, but I never look at like the socionics, inner type dynamics or anything like that. So now I have a new technique. So thank you. I'm going to to steal that ASAP. (laughs) Yes, it's just, and also like just thinking about the character's functions and how like they're gonna have discords between them. Mm -hmm. Like for example, <clears throat> my main character is an INFJ mm-hmm. and the main antagonist is an ENTJ Ooh, okay. so you can imagine <laughs> with strong TE as their lead and having like no FE versus somebody who's like pr- one of their secondary function their auxiliary function is FE so they're constantly thinking about like the impact on people around them hmm. and the other guy is just thinking like oh this is what definitely needs to happen <laughs> and like they have a lot of like discord because of that so. yeah yeah interesting i could see how those two would butt heads quite a bit but also get along quite well because yeah. they have the introverted intuition and like they both want to make global things happen mm-hmm. um okay cool so use MBTI are there any other tools that you use maybe for plotting or or for thinking about your characters yeah um, I like to think about what motivates my characters 
Like, why are they here doing these things? Because I have this grand idea for how everything's going to go down. But why would they do it that way? And sometimes even writing, I discover that they wouldn't do it that way. They would do it another way. And yeah. that's really frustrating, but that happens. Mm. Um, and I do use the plot embryo more so for um, revision than for starting it out. I've tried with this book to use it starting out, mm -hmm. but I only get to like the first two or three and then I'm like, I don't know enough about the story to fill this right. in. Right, uh, okay. Because I want it to mm. be detailed and clear and I want to have clear lines and it's impossible to do for me until I've written the story because things are going to change from what I've written right now. Yeah. And if I try to make it perfectly plotted, mm -hmm. then I'm going to be mad because it's not going to end up that way. So. Interesting. So I know what the plot embryo is, but would you care to explain it for the sake of anybody who's ignorant of it? Yeah, so who was it? Like Dan Harmon who created it and Rachel Stevens or Steven does like a cool version of it. Mm -hmm. But um, basically you have like a circle and it's cut into half and half and like you have your ignorance on one's on the first half and then you have your um, understanding of the situation on the other side or whatever it is they could whatever however you choose to interpret it it doesn't have to be of the situation it could be of something within themselves they could realize something whatever it is about halfway through the story they realize something big mm -hmm. whether it's about themselves about the situation or whatever it is um, and then the top and bottom are comfort zone and discomfort zone. So in the beginning, like quarter of the story, they're completely in their comfort zone and they're just being themselves. And then something happens that forces them to go outside of their comfort zone. And it's outside of their comfort zone that they learn that something. Um, and it seems like just very realistic to just how real life is. Mm -hmm if you were put into some kind of situation, you're going through this yourself. You're yeah. going through the plot embryo. <laughs> yeah. I guess I'm not doing a great job no, of no, describing I think doing, it. I'm just I think <laughs> you're doing a great like job. Um, and I, I'm going to probably put maybe an image of the circle on screen. Okay, um, yeah. But yeah, it's kind of like a more relatable version of the hero's journey. Like it takes right. all of these big concepts like entering the underworld and facing the dragon and makes it more, I guess, psychologically relatable. So it's like, oh, right. I'm entering a zone of discomfort. I'm learning something. It's it's like very psychologically true. Like no matter where you are in life, I feel like right. you're always somewhere on that circle, on that arc. And it's right. obviously like an ongoing kind of spiral. I, I, I really like the, the plot embryo. I think it's awesome and like one of the big concepts for me that I always come back to. Absolutely, I agree. And so you said you only use it for um, revision, and this is something that's kind of odd, so I don't think this is very typical of like an ENTP's writing process, but I actually typically do have an ending in mind, so I usually do have like the circle kind of plotted out from the get-go, but then I give myself a lot of leeway to allow it to transform and then I revise <laughs> with the new circle in mind and I also I mean I think about it maybe too much so I will like think about every single character who's important and like mm -hmm. how that circle manifests for them I also think about it in terms of like the reader so like what state are they starting oh. in whenever I walk them through the story where do I end up bringing them and like what's the, the transition to get there so yeah I, I think about it like a little too much maybe milk it a little too hard <laughs> <laughs> but it works for me and it does help with um, with revising and with everything so I don't know yeah I mean that would be interesting um, and I just wonder if this is like because I don't have high FE but like something that I really struggle to do is to think about my audience <laughs> yeah I'm like oh an audience is gonna read this right <laughs> whereas it sounds like you're thinking about it from the get-go like okay where is yeah. the audience feeling from the beginning and how can I guide them mm -hmm. through this and I am 
I definitely should take the time to do that. And I think there's a part of me that does think about it, but it's so like under the radar, like it's like one of those tangents that's there, mm -hmm. but it's not something that I ever give a whole lot of thought to. It's just always kind of there, like kind of, mm -hmm. somewhat. It's in the shadows, but it's yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think from the very beginning, I try really hard to keep in mind all of the cognitive functions and like mm -hmm. how I would create something that would be appealing across all of those eight dimensions to reach somebody, right. you know, regardless of, of their type. I think that, to be honest, I probably, I fail at that. Like, that's a very ambitious goal. Um, and I don't really think, like, if I could think of, like, what type would really hate my writing the most, I think maybe, like, ISTJ. <laughs> I don't know why, <laughs> but... Like, that's a type that I find very hard to, to relate to or to think about. And maybe I have, like, a lot of unfortunate stereotypes or baggage that prevents me from thinking clearly. I wanted to talk about uh, brainstorming and how that works for you and maybe, you know, compare notes. <laughs> See if I can learn anything from you or vice versa. Okay. Um, well, I would say that, like, one of the main things that I use for brainstorming is, like, a spider thing mm -hmm. where you have like your circle idea and then you can like branch it out into a bunch of other ideas mm -hmm. um, that's like the main thing that I use so I'll have like a character and then I'll be like okay I want the character to have this 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 and this not in any particular order but mm -hmm. these are the things that I know that this character is either gonna do think say or feel those four things and I'll put it all on this like spider graph oh, okay. and then you know, maybe I'll do another character or maybe I'll do like a, a theme. Okay, here's a theme. For example, escapism. Okay, here's all the examples of how that pops up mm -hmm. in the story mm -hmm. in no particular order. So it's kind of like, um, I think it's an anything to like, maybe, I don't know if you've ever used the spider uh, brainstorming. No, but I, 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 see think the, it, I see the appeal and I do something really similar, but I'm not much of... I'm not very visual and so mm. for me I just write it out like I'll have a document where I write like a character name and then a lot of related things and then I'll jump to some other part of the story and then I'll start to think about how it all speaks to itself if that makes mm -hmm. sense like oh okay so if this is part of like the theme if my theme is like entertainment or whatever then that would really connect with this one character's addiction to whatever X Y and Z and then I just kind of jump back and forth, up and down on the page, and I have like a very weirdly internalized map of where everything is located, so I can just like find it really easily. But I don't, yeah, I think that the spider thing is almost too like visual for me. Mm. I definitely need the visual, and I mm -hmm. don't know if that's like a, I don't know if that has anything to do with type, because mm. I'm like trying to think is that a TI thing? Because SI is telling you where things are. Mm -hmm. And the same way that you know where things are and where they're connected, I do that too, but on the visual plane. Right. Like if I just yeah. had a bunch of lists, I would lose the information like like it's nobody's business. Like mm -hmm. I'd be like, okay, I know it's probably on this list, but if I have it visually, then I can recall it in my mind, that visual idea of it. Yeah. And I can be like, okay, here's here's where these and these are, okay blah 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 and I can like draw lines across the paper in between the two and stuff like mm. that I think that so it might have something to do with type like every every ENFP that I've ever known has been like very visual and like hmm. pretty gifted as as an artist or um, even if it's not like conventional art they like make really funny comics and they've always like done silly doodles you know from way back in the day and that I guess I like attempted that. I had a very brief phase, but I was never good at it, so I gave up. That's mm. a that's a horrible character flaw of mine, just so everybody knows. <laughs> if it's not easy, Wait. I'm walking away ASAP. <laughs> no, I think that's an an Ian the EX or ENXP thing, because I think ENFPs do the exact same thing. We're like, oh man, I didn't get it the first try. I'm it's out okay. of here. Yeah. I'll, I'll never come back to it. Maybe I will if I ever think it's worthy of like doing again. Yeah. <laughs> Unless it's like super valuable to something I want to get done, I'll, I'll pretty much give up. Instantly. Yeah. Because it becomes like, 
an SI constraint in a way. Like, yeah. like oh no, I have to like stick with it and I can no longer see all of the, the many possibilities that I had in mind for it. And I have to kind of like defer or delay gratification until I get good at it. So exactly. <laughs> but there are like fifty other things I could get good at that won't require that work. <laughs> so exactly. Screw it. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. And I think I think that right there is why people think that any doms, especially like, are jack of all trades and that they're really smart and good at picking things up. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily that we're good at picking up things. It's that we know when we're going to pick it up easily yeah. and we go after it yeah. whereas other people might not see that potential and might not understand like if you're good at something but it's really actually frustrating to be in any dominant because you're good at so many things but there are so many bajillion people better at you that at everything that you do right like you're never yeah. the best at anything yeah and it's really frustrating because you're just like oh, okay i can i can draw and sing and play guitar okay yeah uh are you good? <laughs> I mean, I can do it. Yeah, like it's <laughs> better than it's Joe functional. Snow over there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, okay. Uh, one thing that I wanted to say about brainstorming that um, has worked for me, and I don't know, I don't think I've ever heard anyone else do this. Um, so I was kind of inspired by uh, one of my favorite writers is Cormac McCarthy. And in one of his books, I think it's only one as far as I know, Every chapter opens with pretty much a summary. It's like chapter one, um, character leaves town, encounters whatever, and it has like little bullet points, but it doesn't somehow spoil the plot. I don't know how that works, but um, so I don't do that in my stories, but I will do that for the sake of like generating ideas really quickly, just like making a huge list of like this happens and then like maybe like bits of language that are really poetic that jump out to me or like strong visuals that I want to incorporate so I just kind of like vomit it all out all of the like really rich material and then I take a deep breath and I start stringing it all together in a very like procedural TISI kind of way um, so I give myself like a moment of <laughs> of colorful any -E FE vomit and then I get to work you know that's interesting. I definitely do something similar. Like I definitely put out like ideas like here's a scene I want to do. Here's this that I want to happen. Um, but I don't know if like certain languages or phrases are something that I really think about a whole lot. Mm -hmm. Like language and how I write is more of a refinement thing for me. Mm -hmm. It's not something that I really think of early. But maybe I'll have like a an opening that I'm like okay this sentence like this right here this is gonna begin this one chapter or something maybe yeah. that'll happen um, but I too think of the end of the story before really anything else I'm like okay, oh, okay. how's this thing gonna end okay so how is this gonna lead up to it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's tricky but I think we kind of have to do it <laughs> as any doms if we want to or we'll have a never-ending story. Yeah, which, which sounds kind of cool in a way, but <laughs> yeah. Um, so one other thing that kind of, besides N-E, one other thing that binds the two of us here is N-A-N-O, which by that, by that I mean NaNoWriMo. Um, and so I figured we could talk about that briefly. Um, mainly, like, what you feel like you've learned from doing it you know consecutive years and how is it informing your writing process so definitely the biggest thing that I've learned from Nano is that if you don't put the time you're not gonna get the words so when I was working at a hotel I was like 19 um, I was telling this guy that I work with all about how I was gonna do NaNoWriMo and I was super excited and I was like here's my story idea and blah 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 he's like you're not gonna do it and I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm going to do it. I'm going to get the whole 50,000 words. I still hadn't won yet at this point. I was just like, I'm going to do it. It'll be fine. <laughs> I'll figure it out. He's like, you're not going to do it. And I was like, what are you talking about? And he's like, you don't write every day now. So how do you expect yourself to write every day for 30 days when you never write? 
And I was like, it'll be fine, I'll figure it out. And did I figure it out? No, I wrote for like a week and then I gave up and I was like, man, truer words were never spoken to me, <laughs> but I was too stubborn. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that's something that I've been like consistently working on. And last year, I didn't write a novel and the reason is, I never made the time to write. Like, I, I never made the time to write. Mm -hmm. And this year I finished a novel in 20 days. Like, I finished it yeah. way quicker and it's purely because I just force myself to sit down and write. Yeah. Congrats, by the that's way. That's the biggest thing. That's so thing. awesome. Thanks. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, Nano, it, it can be pretty, pretty grueling. I think the first time that I did it, I only won because I was living at home and didn't have a job. <laughs> but that told me that I could do it. And so it became, I mean, I've only done it. Um, I guess like this is my third time but it was just good to know that it was feasible and if I could carve out a little time then I could make it work so yeah it's 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 a good experience even for people who uh, who hate to be <laughs> controlled even by their right. own choices <laughs> <laughs> right yeah I think like the biggest thing is you gotta well it's like Maybe the reason why you haven't done it more than three years is because you did win the first time. Because mm -hmm. I almost feel like the only reason I have kept going is because I didn't win. And I was like, I'm gonna freaking win this oh, thing I one see. day or another. So I got that like determination mm -hmm. because I didn't win ever for like five years in a row. I was like, this is, I'm not gonna keep wasting my time. I'm gonna actually like do the work and get myself an actual novel. Whereas like somehow you wrote a whole novel <laughs> like yeah. on your first try. Yeah. I'm like, dang, that that seems like no wonder you've only done it three times. And I'm not trying to like uh, insult you or anything. No, I'm I know. Just more saying like, if I had done it the first time, I probably would have. You wouldn't like, have oh, felt okay, that I can write fire. A novel. Yeah. 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 No, not insulted at all. Um, and in fact, like. This is a tip or a gift I'm giving you. Like, I just encourage you to get really depressed, quit your job, move in with your parents. I promise you, you'll get it done <laughs> every time. <laughs> uh... <laughs> and that's my tip for everyone. On the topic of tips, <laughs> do you have any? Quit your job. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you have any parting tips for like a young ENFP who's just trying to figure it all out as a writer? I guess. Not, um, not in general. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as an ENFP, I would tell you that you need to drop your illusions about how great you are and realize that you have things to work on more than likely. And if you take a look at what those things are that you need to work on, you'll probably be able to overcome them instead of acting like, oh, it'll be fine. I'll, I'll succeed instantly. <laughs> like, no. <laughs> Unless you just happen to like, you know, be in his situation but <laughs> you're probably not because I've been in a similar situation and did not get any writing done yeah. so <laughs> just have some self-discipline <laughs> yeah and then at the end you have a book to show for it so that's pretty cool yeah yeah all right well I think that's all that I had so thank you so much Michelle for coming onto my channel and for sharing your wisdom um, Hopefully we'll we'll talk again soon in a public way, and uh, yeah, everybody who's watching should definitely go to Michelle's channel and check it out. It's Michelle Wilson. I will link it in the description, and that's all I got. So until next time, guys. Bye. <laughs>